Good evening, everybody. My name is Jennifer. Welcome to this evening's Rosa uh, webinar on new approaches to feeding late pregnancy you. So hopefully um, you're here because you are interested in the Register of Sheep Advisors. Um, if you know, want to know a bit more about it, we're going to um, sort of have a bit of a chat about it at the end of this evening's webinar. So we're being joined this evening by three speakers. So Bryn Hughes from Wednesday, who's going to be sort of really talking about soy use and how to try and reduce it in you diets. We've got Kate Phillips, independent consultant, talking about some project work she's done on high protein forages, so silages. And we've got Neris from HDB um, sort of talking about body condition score. So we've got a good range of speakers talking about various elements of you rationing. We've also got opportunities as we go through the evening to ask them questions. So if you want to put any questions in the chat or Q&A um, button at the bottom, so click on that and type away, and I'll be having a look at them as we go through the evening. So Re uh, Register of Sheep Advisors was launched last June, and it's just basically an opportunity to get to people who are working with farmers to help them make decisions, sort of come together and sort of build a bit of a community and support one another in terms of improving our knowledge. So that's the, and what we've identified is in terms of the points that are being collected by members, which mean you nutrition is one of those areas that uh, needed a bit more support regarding some CPD. So this is why we're doing this evening's webinar. So again, in advance, thank you very much for the speakers for their time for this evening. Just before we make a start, there's a quick poll to do just to check who is on the call this evening. So I'll just launch it now. Um, so hopefully that will be up on your screen. So quite simple question. Who are you? In the nicest possible way. Are you a vet advised SQP? Are you a sheep farmer? You could be both. Um, but yeah, choose the one you wish to be this evening. Um, it just helps our um, speakers just have an understanding of who is in the audience. The webinar was very much um, sort of designed for an advisor type person who would be going out and talking to various farmers but again the technical knowledge is, is relevant to anybody who wants to join. It is being recorded um, as we go through so if you missed bits or want to catch up with it later it will be available on the NSA and Rosa website in the next few days. So what we'll do now is we'll hand over to Bryn so as everybody comes in they'll be switching their video on and they'll be using their screen to um, talk through their slides. So come on down, Bryn. Um, again, if you've got any questions as you go through, please just chat, uh, put them in the chat or Q&A function. We'll deal with relatively simple ones at the end of each presentation, but we gather me more meaty ones for a general discussion at the end. Um, so Bryn, I can see your slides. I can't see you. Are you there, Bryn? Right, is everything right, oh. Liz? Yeah, and um, you're not on full screen, so we can see your main screen. So I think if you click on, there's a button that says resume slideshow, it should bring you up, sort of near the top left. There is, but uh, there we have it. Doesn't seem to be. If you maybe press escape. <laughs> Don't press. <laughs> Where's the mouse gone? Um, or... Ooh. No. Maybe... Cro We're there? We're there. Excellent. I'm just going to, yeah, I'll put myself on mute, but I'll give you a five minute warning near the end of your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, and good evening. Um, thanks for the invite to talk to you tonight. I've got a, um, I haven't got into too, too much depth and detail on some aspects of the things, but hopefully it's going to be a, a reasonably uh, enjoyable evening. Uh, we're all giving up our own time to do this, so um, I hope you enjoy it anyway. Um, my name is Brynn Hughes, as Liz said. I'm the uh, National Sheep and Beef Manager for Wednesday. Um, have been for a couple of years, really. I've uh, got a um, kind of long-term interest in sales to farmers for about 15 years. I'm also a sheep farmer in Southeast Wales. 
um, and previous to that, I've got a, a long history of farm management as well. So there we are. Right, we're going to try and keep it reasonably um, light and entertaining if we can, with a bit of detail on some of the more important aspects of it. Um, I think one of the things that we do need to keep in perspective is that we're fighting a little bit of a battle um, regarding uh, the, the um, position of red meat in people's diets. Um, a lot of the information that is pretty unfair, um, a lot of fights going on about the environmental aspects of it. And one of the things that when I joined Rosa, and I remember having a uh, conversation with Liz really was about how do we change some of this narrative and how can we as advisors help uh, the industry possibly change some of these attitudes that other people have towards it? Um, got a slide there, uh, attended the HCC conference you know, before Christmas, was it? And, you know, there's, there are some very, very good people who advocate in red meat. Um, Diana Rogers is a good one from the States there, and there's quite a few others there. But it does help if you have a bit of information from other other sources to try and counter some of the so there are the biased arguments that we come across. And on the same theme, really, I was uh, and I attended a FUW webinar this morning, and there was um, it was a, it was a good webinar in that they tried to put a balanced view over. There was a guy from New Zealand talking about. Um, how a lot of New Zealand's been sold for trees. The same thing is happening in Wales. There were a couple of guys from the um, kind of the forestry side of it who have got reasonably good arguments initially until you really push them. So um, I pushed a couple of them and, uh, you know, there's a major problem really there that we're replacing what is good food producing ground with with trees and I don't think it's the way to go and it's important that we as an industry have a have a very very clear counter argument to their arguments so what I'm going to do really is I'm going to briefly look at the world perspective in terms of soya and proteins I'll then look at the um the UK perspective um and then we'll just focus in a little bit on what you can do on your own farm or onto the farms that you're advising on. And I think it's important within these um, conversations that we have a have an overall view of what, what's happening in the world. And also, you know, where where does the UK fit in? And when, where does your own business or the own, own people that you're advising fit in as well? Okay. Uh, so I'll start off really with, um, you know, we've, we've had for, quite a number of years really that you know the world population is on exponential growth there are some signs now that um this growth will flatten out um but what the graph doesn't tell you really is that um the majority of the growth in the next 30 years is projected to be in africa uh, a little bit in southeast asia but the actual population of um what we consider to be the western world is um slightly on the decline now whether the growth in Africa actually happens or not, because we know it doesn't take long to create another uh, human being, um, is you know is up to I suppose a lot of a lot of external factors. But one of the things you need to bear in mind is that about forty percent of the population in Africa is Muslim, and um, they tend to be heavier consumers of of lamb than um, some of the um, religions in the in the world so you know bear this graph in mind now because it also links in quite nicely to the following um, graph which shows what's happened to soya production in the world in the last um, 50 years or so and if you focus a little bit on um uh, this um period here you can see that there's been since about the year 2000 there's been almost a doubling of it now this graph shows two countries okay the united states and brazil uh, and they between them produce about 80 85 percent of the world's um crop of soya now the other thing that you should have really on here is that the area for growing soya has increased in line with that, but the actual yield per hectare 
of soya has not increased significantly. So there's been a large increase in the area of the world that is um, devoted to growing soya. It's a profitable crop um, and you know there's been a major increase in there. Argentina would be the other um, major producer of soya. Some's, some is grown in Europe, um, but those are the you know the two main countries. And there's obviously there's a major impact there in terms of um, you know land use change, um, and it does have a, a little bit of a um, you know it's a bit little bit of a bad news story really. Um, okay, and then sort of to link in then really is where does this soya go to now? Trying to find unbiased um, or accurate information on um, some of these things on the internet is is difficult okay and um, I'm a little bit nervous about putting some slides up with, where you haven't kind of cross references but this is about the best source that I, I found at the time um, direct human food is about 20 percent Animal feed, there's 77% in an industry in terms of oils, lubricants is a, is a small proportion, 3%. And then you can see there that uh, poultry and pigs are major consumers, as you would expect. Poultry diets tend to be around about the 20%, 25% soya. The rest of them made up of wheat and pigs would be the same. Now, interestingly here, um, we carried out an exercise, um, which is quite a lengthy exercise about six months ago really to take soya out of um egg production um and this was with in conjunction with a major retailer um and we formulated the rations we trialed the rations and they worked perfectly well um and the conclusion was that it was going to cost about 10 15 pound a ton more that's about 3p a dozen on the eggs um and the major retailer pulled out so Sometimes it puts a little bit of perspective in that um, there's a lot of noise about these things, but when it actually comes to the um, pound signs, um, people are a little bit more reluctant to put their hands in their pockets. And if we look down, if we drill down into the data there, you can see that beef in the world use 0.5% of, of the um, soya consumption, although there's a little bit of in, um, correlation, I suppose, with um, increasing beef herds in in Brazil, the cattle graze the ground first and then they follow it in with soya afterwards. And you can see that sheep don't actually um, appear on this graph, um, but they are around about the 0.3%, right? So, um, and then if you look at the um, UK statistics, um, you know, the UK um, sheep concentrate market is around about the 600,000 tonnes. Uh, Winsdale do about 80,000 tonnes of that. Um, and, you know, generally the soya inclusion rates are very low. OK, um, no real need for them in finishing diets. They're in creep diets. Um, and then I suppose the biggest use of them is in um, pregnancy diets, really, where, you know, over the years, some of us are old enough to remember fish meal. It was a replacement for fish meal in in um, ewe diets. Um, and, it, you know, soya is a good source of undegradable protein. It's a good source of amino acids. And um, there's been a lot of research in the last 25, 30 years um, to kind of prove the value of of soya in in sheep rations now that's a little bit unfortunate really in that um it's most probably not where we we want to be at the moment um and you know it's something that most probably if we're going to have the image that we uh, want with um sheep production that we most probably going to have to change something and then Remember that concentrates or other cereals or whatever only form a very, very small part of a, uh, of a ruminant's diet. Um, and if you ever study a feed label, like, like unfortunately I do a lot of the time, 
you know, the first line on it is it's a complementary feed for uh, for sheep. OK, so, you know, it is to counterbalance or to balance up um, natural products, the grass and the uh, silages and the hay that we grow for them. And this kind of infographic, which I find think is quite useful, really, for us to remember that, you know, not all the feed that we feed uh, ruminants um, is suitable for human consumption. And you can see there, that's a worldwide um, figure. There's a lot of these kind of figures around, uh, but you can see that 46% grass and leaves would be up a lot higher in the UK. Um, and then, you know, you're down to about 13% of, of grains there as well. So, you know, good counter arguments here really that, um, you know, the majority of our ruminants in the UK are fed on things that are absolutely inedible to humans. Now, to say all that, um, uh, there is pressure within um, within the industry to change. Okay, now apologies that this is on its side, um, and it makes it pretty difficult to read unless you can crank your head to the side. But in about two thousand and fifteen, there was a round table set up um, for sustainable soil use. A lot of uh, pressure in the press. Um, this round table has been going on now for five years. There was an action point for 2020. There's another one for 2022. And most of the major uh, players in the UK um, feed and food industry are signed up to this uh, pledge. And what is the pledge really is that um, no new deforestation will happen uh, or soya from those areas will be used. Now, it gets a little bit murky in that a lot of this stuff is done on mass balance, which means that the actual soya that you buy from a sustainable scheme might not be from a sustainable source, but the area is allocated to that. So, you know, it's a little bit open to kind of um, people pulling the scheme apart, but, you know, the, the whole idea or the concept is correct um, and it's um, it's something that's necessary and you can see there that you know leading brands Tesco's Nestle Sainsbury's they're all there um, committed to this soya manifesto now in addition to this pressure from um, from the sustain the round table there's pressure from individual retailers who want to go a step further um, and working on the formulation size of, of, of sheep rations, uh, we will get requests most probably once a fortnight from a retailer requesting, you know, how much soya have you got in your rations? Uh, what, how much palm kernel is in there? Um, and we're expected to provide that information um, to the retailers, okay? So um, we do, some retailers go, go a step further and they want to do an independent audit of the of the information or the mills. Um, and we're a little bit kind of reluctant with that because we're already, um, you know, farm assured or youth as assured, which is the same as, um, you know, a farm should be farm assured as well. So that's the pressure. So pressure really from that side of it. And there's also pressure from individual uh, retailers uh, or the processes for those retailers to set up kind of gold plated schemes to um, cut down on the um, amount of soya in, in the rations. Now, long term, it's most probably going to be a, a, a worthy goal. Short term, there is the issue of if you take soya out, you need to replace it with something else. And generally, there's something else, you need a bit more of it. So um, it can cause a few issues. And the bit that you need a bit more of sometimes isn't as, bit as available as, as soya. So um, it's, you know, as in a, a lot of these environmental schemes or ideas, you know, if you push down on one thing, something else pops up elsewhere and... Um, it does really need um, a lot of joined up thinking, which I don't think a lot of people are especially good at. So, um, yeah, so that's where the, you know, the pressure is coming from. Um, now, 
for everybody who's, um, you know, this is most probably our our manual that we um, kind of refer to a lot from within the feed industry and also as as advisors as well. And you try to stick to the rules there. It's been updated. Um, there are, um, you know, there's good advice in there. What I haven't done, okay, um, is that I haven't copied out a whole series of um, tables from this book or anything. We're just going to have a, just a bit more of a general kind of conversation about feeding the ewe um, and the critical period really um, is upon us now, I should think, or maybe it has been arrived on a, a lot of farms but you know late pregnancy early lactation is the absolute critical period for um, meeting the use requirements and this is where traditionally um, a lot of soya has been uh, drawn into the rations now I've been That's selling sheep five minutes left sorry yeah no problem thanks Liz. Um, I've been selling sheep feed for um, 15 or so years and the farmers amongst us tonight will will know the first question you always get is how much is your um, best sheep kick which is open to um, a tremendous amount of um, salesman's license and also um, open to a lot of kind of skull degree as well right but um, you know hopefully most well, nearly all um, proper compounders will be formulating to meet the energy and the protein requirements of the use, um, you know, and all standard um, concentrates, right, will um, be designed to provide between 40 and 60 grams of um, DUP in, uh, for the late pregnancy stage. Uh, that's four to six percent. Uh, in Wednesday, we've had a policy for the last three or four years, really, where we don't go underneath the 5.5%, uh, 55 grams of DUP. And we find with um, we've almost stuck to the same formulations now for the last um, four years that not changing them. There hasn't been enough um, difference between the raw material markets um, to change the rations and sticking with what you know um, helps a great deal now we carried out an exercise last year and we've done it again this year we looked at our um leading um formulation of sheep cake um and we said can we formulate this without um without any soya and palm kernel. So we stick to the same parameters, uh, including things like quality of the cake as well, because those are things that sometimes, if you're not involved in the compound feed industry, you won't realize that, you know, sometimes you've got to have sticky ingredients in there to make the cake stick together. And, you know, as last year, this year as well, we can formulate a leading ration really in our range without any soya in there, without any palm kernel in there, and it'll meet exactly the same um, specification and the um, nutritional requirements that we set for the cake. Um, so next question, I suppose, is why don't you do that? Um, and one of the major problems really is that we, as a, an industry of advisors, advisors have you know led on from the, um, how much is your best sheep cake? question to what's the ME and most yeah quite often I get what's the soya content of the cake um, and that's it's been a measure of quality really in cake for for quite a while and it's not really where we should be at um, but you know you ask the um, standard kind of question really then you know what's the DUP requirement should be the question really isn't it um, so why has soya found its way into um, these rations? Well, you know, you has a, a requirement pre lambing depending on the size. All these tables are in the HDB book, but you know, anything from thirty to forty-five grams of DUP pre uh, pre lambing, and then that goes up then anything from sixty to one hundred and fifty grams of uh, DUP when she's uh, fresh in milk. So you can see then that by looking at this. Uh, table. This is a table um, that we use in the compounding industry. It's an atlas of raw materials. 
their standard values. They're updated every year according to um, a mass analysis. Okay, and you can see that the DUP content of soybean meal is 20.7. So one of the higher, in, higher contents of DUP, so that's why it's liked. Um, but you can also see that, um, you know, rape meal um, is 8.2, maize distillers, field beans, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, down, down there in terms of their value. So, you, you know, you need, um, you know, a fair percentage of these other materials to make up for the uh, soya nearly twice as much. Now, one of the real quick wins, but I don't think it's particularly um, appropriate maybe, is that, right, get rid of the soya, and we'll um, just put protected soybean meal, meal in. What does it mean? Well, you'd almost have the um, amount of soya that you'd use in sheep rations. Uh, but the problem being there really is that there is quite a high kind of carbon cost to the treatment of soya bean meal. It's either heat treated or it's chemically treated. So um, although it's a nice quick win, yes, we've halved the amount of soya bean meal in, in the sheep industry, which probably isn't the best route. And then there's also questions then, yeah, we can, um, you know, if you looked at the diets that we um, um, reformulated recently to get rid of soya, uh, soya was in there of just under 10%. We had to put 16% rape seed meal in there. And, it, you know, there's a little bit of an environmental question about rape meal, a lot, lot less area grown in the UK. The price is sky high and a lot of it is, is imported from uh, sort of Eastern Europe where, you know, there's pressures there on the um, political scene as well. And then just to go down to field beans, you know, good source of UK protein, really. Um, it's available. It's a very, very good source, source of starch as well. And I think the field beans will um, gradually find their way into um, a lot more uh, rations in the next two or three years, as long as we can, we can source them. Now, I suppose there is a question as well, is that, you know, have we been a little bit too precise and a little bit too posh about, um, you know, DUP requirements? And could we, could we scale those back a little bit? Um, and making sure as well that, you know, like uh, the metabolizable protein is an important factor really in that, you know, very, very good quality silage, plenty of energy from cereals, and you'll get away with a little bit less overall protein in these rations. Um, and then, you know, why um, is soya an important- Just last slide, please, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, why is soya so important really is that, well, it's a bad news story and we want to try and get it out of um, our rations. So there we are. Are we hooked on soya? Possibly at the moment, but I think if we can change the industry's perspective and it's important that we do this as advisors, um, one thing is for certain that we can formulate without soya and all the trials and rations that we have done um, and, you know, the advisory services have done have proved that you can. Thanks, Liz. Nearly got there. Uh, thanks, Bryn. There's just a quick uh, question from Joe. Is, do you, are you aware if the soy production in the US and Brazil is driven by agricultural demand or human food demand? Hmm. Good question. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, okay. you. Um, Kate, if you're happy to um, put your video up and start sharing your slides, please. Tell me when it's there, Liz. Uh, perfect. And then it's not quite full. It's not full screen, but it's on. Yeah, I'm trying. Okay, just pressed it. Hopefully it's coming up. No, not yet. Try again. Yep. Yep, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, and thanks, Bryn. I found that really interesting. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to say to you that um, AHDB or when Liz was in AHDB, um, they kindly funded a trial at Reese Heath College that I was in charge of. And um, we looked at um, TMR rations with different protein sources and we compared soya to rape to wheat distillers grains and to beans. 
And with very fit mule ewes, we had no problem at all with those of the protein sources. They were all performed the same. So the only thing was the soya ration was the most expensive one. So um, quite interesting that you're saying, and I think we have been historically hooked up on soya because we knew it was such high quality, um, but increasingly moving towards being asked by lots of farmers to take it out of rations um, and look to other sources. And I think as long as we have the, the ewe in good condition, she's much more able to cope than if a thin ewe, and certainly work at Harper Adams that I've been involved in, has shown that it is thin ewes that respond to more DUP and the fit ones generally do cope well. So um, anyway, just thought I'd add that in at this point because it followed on nicely from what you've been saying, Bryn. Um, so um, some time ago, I was, um, well, I maybe should introduce myself. Um, I'm an independent sheep consultant. I did work for ADAS for 30 years, um, largely as a sheep specialist and nutritionist, um, but uh, gave up in ADAS in 2014 and then went to work part time at Harper Adams as a senior lecturer and um, also worked independent as a, you know, an independent consultant. Um, so some of you might have come across me in one of those roles. Um, so um, and when I went to Harper Adams, um, I was in the lucky position to be able to um, utilize their research facilities there. And one of the things that was sort of eating away at me at the time, and, and it's a very pertinent now a few years later um, was the fact that we were importing so much protein and could we actually minimize the amount we were bringing into the country by looking at high protein forages and growing our own protein. So um, I was lucky um, to work with Robert Wilkinson and Nikki Naylor at Harper Adams and um, AHDB, uh, great, you know, uh, very generous in providing the funding for the trial. So I thought what I'd do was walk you through this trial um, uh, as straightforwardly I can, um, and then just talk about some of the issues with high protein forages that I'm seeing on the ground, really. So um, first one. So um, of course, a need to use more homegrown proteins and to reduce the cost of production. We know how expensive supplements are and Bryn won't like me for saying that, but that's what's happening. Um, supplements are incredibly expensive. And, um, you know, I was on a farm today when one farmer said to me he'd, he'd had, he's growing all sorts of interesting um, new forages. And, you know, he'd had 14 grass silage, uh, silage analyses done um, on 14 different fields. And he was in, he's taking it so seriously and looking at how he could stop giving any supplements to his animals at all. And I think he's going to make it, you know, he's taking it very, very seriously. And more and more farmers are going that way. So reduce dependence on imported proteins. And one thing I think we we're not particularly good at is in, in predicting the dry matter intake of forages. Um, in our, you know, feeding the U book, um, we have given guidance on that, but it's not always easy um, from a forage analysis. And forage analysis isn't always perfect. Um, I think I'd be the first to admit that, um, but it is something we have to do to get a, a, a measure of what we're working with. And of course, we're always looking to increase efficiency of sheep production and particularly with the climate change agenda, you know, we have to look to, um, uh, yeah, just, just be more efficient and reduce our emissions. So this maybe is one way of trying to do that too. So um, that's where we started from. So what I um, worked with the colleagues at Harper to design a trial and um, this is what we came up with. We compared four forages. We were looking for high protein forages. So on the farm at Harper, uh, standard um, feeds for the dairy cows there were maize silage and lucerne silage. So that lucerne was an easy one. Um, grass silage was also made. So we were lucky to have a pretty high quality grass silage on the farm that year. And I had to buy, go out and buy some red clover silage. Um, and we also had some urea treated whole crop wheat, um, which was our sort of other fourth forage, which was going to be uh, trialed against the other ones. So you can see those that that was the analysis as they came into us. Um, so quite variable, really, in analysis from 11.7 in theory for the grass silage to 9.1 for the red clover silage. So we formulated the rations to the minimum supplementation needed to meet the FRC, AFRC 1993 um, ME and MP requirements. 
So on all the silages, we only gave the used barley and beet pulp pre-lambing, and that was based on their energy and protein requirements. And post-lambing, they had barley, beet pulp and soybean meal, okay, to supplement them in early lactation, because these ewes were housed from eight weeks pre-lambing right through to four weeks post-lambing. So we had to take them through that whole period. Um, we had 48 twin bearing ewes, they all averaged about 75 kilograms live weight and they formed from week minus eight to minus six, that's pre-lambing. They were fed in groups of 12 um, and fed ad-lib forage to get them acclimatized to the diets. Then from week minus six, they were individually penned um, and to um, week plus four. So they lambed in those pens and all measurements were done on them on in, in, individual pens. Um, and they were all turned out to grass at week plus four post lambing. And those ewes had to endure quite a bit of um, poking and, and handling throughout that time. So we measured individual forage dry matter intake. We weighed them regularly. We condition scored them regularly. We took regular blood samples. So we looked for um, a typical sort of metabolic profile really that many commercial sheep farmers would, would do with their vets. Um, we did a beta hydroxybutyrate analysis to check on energy. Um, uh, levels, a urea to track, check on rumen degradable protein supply, albumin to check on um, basic protein um, requirements. And we did some other um, analysis too, just to look at um, uh, um, non-esterified fatty acids and glucose, um, just uh, as measures of uh, energy sufficiency. And we also weighed and measured the lambs on a regular basis, on a weekly basis from birth, their birth weight um, to 14 weeks of age. So this was a setup at Harper. So they were Suffolk Cross mule ewes, all set in individual pens, bedded on sawdust, so that there was no um, risk of them eating any of their bedding, which added to their forage dry matter intake. So I just wanted to show you the sort of intakes we got. So from now on, everybody, you can see that the red lines on the graphs I'm gonna show you, the red lines are red clover intake. The yellow is the urea treated whole crop. The blue is the lucerne and the grass is the green, okay? So hopefully they sort of correspond with the type of silage we, we've got in front of them. And as I think you'll be able to tell, the red clover silage intake uh, way out, where, you know, way out sort of numbered the um, other silages. Um, and just to put it in perspective, the red clover was significantly at a high level of significance statistically, higher than all the other forages to week um, minus, what was it, My, week plus one. Okay, so that sort of shows you how much more of a red clover silage, this wasn't a pure red clover silage, it was mixed with um, perennial ryegrass, but um, in my experience of walking amongst those pens with those ewes, the how much you like this silage is phenomenal. The ewes that didn't have red clover in their um, bee forage boxes were trying to get into the pens to the ewes that actually were on the red clover. So they were trying to get under or over, whichever way they could try to do it to get some of the red clover. It's incredibly palatable. And one of the worries when we were doing this work that was, you know, we were gonna get prolapsing ewes. Um, we didn't get any prolapses of any significant, there was one ewe that um, showed a slight prolapse, but she had prolapsed the year before. So um, we didn't take that as one of uh, an indicator of any issue with the forage. But the one thing that was very significant was how, um, how palatable they found it and how much they actually ate. So you can see a very big difference between the grass silage particularly and the red clover silage, despite that red, clover, that red grass silage being really high quality silage. So much, much more palatable um, than the other three silages. So, and not surprisingly, when we were weighing these ewes, um, you can see the red line again, the ewes that were eating the red clover silage, even though it, in it theory, it analyzed at 9.1 um, ME. Um, the ewes that were eating so much silage actually maintained a much higher body condition score than uh, many of the other ewes on the uh, trial. So the red clover ewes were actually significantly heavier than the grass fed or the lucerne fed animals up to week minus two. So quite interesting that, well, it's not, it's just probably exactly what you'd expect. They were eating so much that they actually maintained a heavier weight and certainly had a better body condition score, which is on the next um, slide. 
So there's the body condition score. Um, you know, you, you generally would accept a small amount of body weight loss, um, uh, or it, it might be inevitable. Um, but um, you can see we're sliding from a, a range of about three down to the worst body condition score just before lambing of about 2.7, 2.5 to 2.7. But the red clove I use, um, really did maintain their body condition very well um, throughout, really. So um, I mentioned that, that we were doing blood sampling throughout the period. So week minus eight, minus six, minus three, minus one, two and four. Um, and as you can see, if you see the top blue line and remember that plasma urea is a measure of um, the adequacy of rumen degradable protein on the day of, of taking the sample. It's sort of how, what's the protein status today. Um, you can see with the lucerne silage, which was very high protein, um, we were getting um, rather high levels of, of plasma urea, much higher than on the other silages. And this suggested to us, although we'd formulated the diets to um, be balanced for fermentable energy and uh, rumen degradable protein, there still appeared to be a lot of rumen degradable protein that was almost going to waste because it hadn't been captured by the FME in the rumen. So um, suggesting we should have put some more beet pulp and barley in to capture that um, uh, spare protein, should we say, but there was a better utilization of protein, um, it appeared to be, on the other three silages. And one thing to remind everybody about is that the degradability of protein in red clover silage is lower than in lucerne, so you get far more. It's, it's something like um, 25 to 35% undegradable DUP in a red clover silage, as opposed to 15 to 25% in a um, lucerne silage. So that could help to explain some of the, imp the improved performance on the red clover being a slightly higher level of DUP than you would get on the lucerne. So the lamb birth weights were very, very similar, all weighing in as about five kilos on average. Just to say these were all twin bearing ewes, so we haven't got singles or triplets on this, um, this trial. And they were weighed, you can see we've got a slight advantage to the red clover um, lambs up to 14 weeks of age. And putting that in um, perspective of um, the growth rates up to eight weeks, you can see the red clover lambs, if you look across the graph, growth rate on the left hand column and across the right, uh, the bottom axis, we've got the types of forage and the blue column is the um, growth to eight weeks and the green column to 14 weeks. So up to eight weeks, it does show fairly clearly that we had an advantage to the red clover fed ewes in terms of grass uh, lamb growth um, up to eight weeks. It rather sort of evens out by the time we're getting up to 14 weeks, but obviously the grass, the grass quality and um, availability of other feed would be impacting by then. Um, so what we, it wasn't statistically as in, you know, a probability of 0.05, but it was actually um, a tendency and a trend towards the red clover lambs growing faster than the grass fed lambs in particular, because there was a big difference between the red clover and the grass. So just to conclude the trial, and there have been other pieces of work done quite similarly to this. There was a, a trial done back in 20, uh, 2005 at Ibers by, I um, don't know how to pronounce the person's name, but it's Spagers, uh, um, but they did a similar trial, but they were actually feeding far more uh, beet pulp. They fed between 0.25 of a kilo of beet pulp up to one point over a kilo of beet pulp um, to use pre-lambing. So that was sort of limiting the amount of forage those ewes were taking. So I think in this one, we tried to let the uh, forage basically uh, be the majority of the diet and minimize the amount of supplementation. So all we were doing was adding fermentable energy really to the diets pre-lambing. So our conclusions from this work the red clover silage proved incredibly palatable and certainly there's many farmers out there telling me exactly the same um, and it's just nice to have sort of um, 
got this data to back them up really. Uh, very palatable, use ate significantly more than use eating all the other forages, um, despite what appeared to be a low predicted metabolizable energy on the red clover. And they ate a phenomenal amount if you were looking at as a percentage of body weight compared to the other diets. You know, we, we wouldn't be expecting 2.3% of body weight um, of an intake of a grass silage, for instance. And you can see the other silages that we looked at, 1.5 percent of body weight to 1.7 so the red clover did outstrip that and that's something that farmers when they're growing um, red clover for silage making need to consider that they really need rather more than they would if they were going to be actually just growing a grass silage. Um, the red clover ewes maintain body weight and body condition score better than ewes on all the other forages. And as I hope Neris is going to say to you shortly, um, you know, maintaining body weight and condition is really paramount to, to, in terms of lamb survival, milk yield, you know, uh, ongoing high performance of ewes. So that is all good news in terms of ongoing performance. Um, um, and the lambs born to the red clover um, uh, ewes, that should say, tended to grow faster than gram the lambs on the grass silage fed um, group. So um, all good news, really. Further, um, just to think about it, intake predictions for red clover and perennial ryegrass mixes need to be higher than for other silages. So we need to accommodate that when we're thinking about dietary intake and we're formulating rations. Um, for the high protein lucerne, which probably is less uh, universally appealing to many farmers, I mean, it's, it likes dry conditions, does lucerne, um, a deep taproot again, like red clover um, plants, um, but um, maybe not, not giving the performance that we see from red clover, and it does need rather more fermentable energy to capture that ERDP. Um, so I think there's a great potential for red clover in new diets to reduce concentrate costs, and of course, the regrowth is fantastic for lamb finishing too. Um, so just another little bit, we had no metabolic problems with any of the ewes um, and blood samples were taken um, regularly through the trial. There was no bloating and there was just simply one vaginal prolapse in the red clover group. But as I said earlier, that was just one ewe that had prolapse the year before. So we couldn't really make anything of that. There was a certain amount of mastitis in the ewes, but I put that down to um, being in individual pens for weeks on end, really, um, and that sort of, you know, associated stress, really, um, but um, nothing that wasn't dealt with uh, by antibiotic treatment. So that was that. And just like to acknowledge, again, because the general support from AHD <coughs> that, and um, GLW feeds <coughs> founder in the um, uh, Midlands actually funded the straits and the minerals for us and Harper Adams, some um, honours research um, student, you know, yeah, students did their um, honours research projects on this and helped with a lot of the physical hard work of the, of the project. So um, I just want to add a little bit of extra information because um, out in the field, when I'm working with farmers and looking at silage analyses, um, it, it's not very straightforward with unusual silages. Um, so it is better for red clover to be using wet chemistry, certainly with, to measure the crude protein. I've had one client very recently who we got some very weird low levels of protein and I sent it off for wet chemistry and we come back. Well, I was a bit dismayed because it came back as something like 6% and 5%. And then it took me a little while for the penny to drop that they'd re reported on a fresh weight basis rather than a dry matter basis, um, which confused me in the, to start thinking, well, red clover silage always has between 15 and 18% um, protein. But it was um, always make sure if you're looking at analysis that you know whether it's on a dry matter or a fresh weight basis. So wet chemistry um, and uh, we're in a red clover often analyzes quite poorly from an ME perspective, but feeds much better. Um, and so always get that protein analyzed by wet chemistry. And just in case you're an advisor looking at this, um, I just looked at two laboratories to see what they're offering in terms of red clover analysis and lucerne analysis. Scientech, which is one I use quite regularly because they do give me the information I need to formulate rations in terms of fermentable energy, DUP and ERDP, um, but they don't have an NIR 
red clover calibration curve. Um, and most of those um, silages are going in as a grass silage. Um, and that is a cost of £16.99 at the moment. But they do have a lucerne and other category. So I'm not sure whether we should be putting our red clovers through that um, category. But I was told just by an email that they put the red clovers through the grass silage analysis at the moment. So we need to probably do a bit more research on that. And then I looked at Eurofins, which is another supplier, although there's lots of other ones. These are just two I picked up and thought about yesterday. Um, they have a grass and clover analysis rather than just a grass silage analysis. They have a grass and clover analysis, but um, and a, an individual lucerne analysis too. But it, but and you get a fair amount of detail, but it is quite a bit more expensive than the Scientech laboratory. So um, that was that. OK, that that was all I wanted to say, Liz. Have I raced through too fast or have I just about got on time? Perfect, because I forgot to run out. I thought you were just finishing, so I didn't give you a five minute warning and then you continued. But yes, perfect timing. Thank, Thank you. you. OK, um, there's a few just a couple of questions relevant to your bit. Uh, yeah. So one which was a, from Joe in terms of any comments about how it affects colostrum quality against soya in terms of red clover silage sorry is there a did you, the work your that research didn't include colostrum quality but in terms of do you see differences we didn't see any differences in lamb survival or get up and go we just saw better growth rates so to me liz if if, if we had measured colostrum quality in that one i think it might well have been just as good actually because um you know we didn't have issues with lamb survival so that would tell me that we've got something um you know going on with that in particular so i think we were meeting the mp requirements and the me requirements those use in fact probably exceeding them with the amount of silage those use eight um so no, no no we're not aware of any issue and certainly talking to farmers who are out there feeding red clover silage without any supplements at all uh, a few of them are doing that they're not reporting problems with, uh, with lamb get up and go or colostrum quality or quantity. So I'm feeling it's it's a pretty all round good, good feed, to be honest. Um, and then just a question regarding that this was obviously one trial, one year, one um, yeah. sort of a silage tested. Do, do you know of any other work that has, pre has looked at red clover? I mean, you mentioned the Aberystwyth work, but is there any other sort of demonstration trials well, we did a second year at Harper Adams, which gave us very similar results. We actually put red clover through with no supplement at all, or with a supplement against a grass silage. So we have got a second year's data, which would back up our first year's data. And there are quite old historic bits of research done on red clover from years ago, because I have, I remember giving this, this sort of presentation or similar presentation to a group of farmers and say, oh, this is what we were doing. These are, you know, um, advisors who were you know older um, and said this is stuff we were doing 20 30 years ago Kate and I thought yeah probably is so it is well founded um there's yeah there's there's a fair bit the bit of the bit of, that was a good paper the spedges one from 2005 actually um because that was pretty thorough but it did they did feed a lot of concentrates to those used um, and one last, there was a comment about trial nutrition that someone, Natalie, who works for trial, will follow up with you because they might be able to do some work, might be able to do something on red clover. So oh, lovely. Yes, look forward to hearing um, from you. There's a few other questions, but I will pick that up, up at the end. Okay, Liz. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, Neris, are you happy to? I'll stop sharing. Sorry, Liz. Thank you. It's up, but not on full screen. Standard statement of mine this evening. Perfect, thank you. For some reason we can't hear you, Neris, even though you say um, you're... I pressed the button on this, sorry. Often. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me uh, to speak this evening. Um, many of you will know that I've been trying to finish a PhD for several years now, but I have finally done it. Um, and so I can finally talk about the findings from that project. Um, so we were... I was asked to talk about monitoring body condition score through pregnancy and lactation. So I've kept it quite broad, um, perhaps not focusing too much on, on late pregnancy, but we can pick that up in the questions as we go on. Um, and funny, Bryn and I have, are going to reference the Feeding the You manual, and that was not planned. Um, so just a few resources that will be available um, to listeners. There is the AHTB manual, Feeding the You, and Improving You Nutrition as well. They're both available on the website. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is currently part of a 300 page thesis. So if anybody fancies reading it, you're very welcome. Um, but I don't think anybody will. Um, I'm in the process of writing a summary report for that, which will be available for the website in the next couple of weeks. So we can probably send a link around um, all the uh, all the participants of, of this call, probably. Um, and I'm also realising that I didn't really properly introduce myself, um, but I work for AHDB in the Knowledge Exchange team. Um, previous to that, I actually worked at ADAS and Kate trained me. So um, most of what I know, I've learned, I've learned from Kate. So it's quite nice to do this call this evening with her. Um, and as I said, I did a body condition scoring based PhD just recently. And I'm going to talk about the findings of, of that this evening. Ve like very sort of headline figures. There's a lot of data that goes behind it, but I'm more than happy. Just don't let me go off on a tangent. Just as a reminder then, I know you all know what bo body condition scoring is, but there was a couple of points I just really wanted to make, you know, about the assessment of it being the subcutaneous fat along the processes of, of use. And I think, you know, we always talk on the scale of one to five and you'll have some people doing it to halves or quarter scores. Um, I just think let's not get too bogged down. If we're thinking about it from talking to farmers about to do more body condition scoring, I think a lot potentially will panic at the thought of putting too much of a number to it. I mean, it's good to have the data and it's great if you're going to monitor that over time and see if you are going up or going down. But when me and my dad used to body condition score, you know, I'd be like, oh, that's a 2.25. And he'd be like, she's thin. So we'd get the same use in the same groups. We would just call it something different. So it's always good to talk about those scales, but let's not get too hung up on what they are. Just encourage farmers to put their hands on the backs of ewes and see which way it's going. Try and do something about those that are too thin. Take out those that are perhaps are getting a bit fit and, and look at it that way rather than getting too bogged down in the numbers. It doesn't need any specialist equipment either. That's, that's the beauty. You just need... A hand. So yes, you're going to have sort of equipment for handling the use, but you'll have that anyway for vaccinations or any dosing that you're going to do or shearing or whatever. And you could argue that if you're going to record the data, then obviously you're going to need some extra software and hardware that, that, that would be in addition to that. But the actual process of body condition scoring itself really isn't something that that, that really is going to cost a fortune. Most of it is, is the time associated with it. And again, it's, you know, it's highly repeatable as well. It, it's so you, we'd sort of say 90 percent within individuals and 80 percent between individuals. And I sort of say the way I like to look at that is if I scored 100 sheep and then I went through them again, I'd agree with myself 90 percent of the time. And then if Liz and I went through, we'd agree with each other you know, 80% of the time. But we see really high levels of consistency up to about quarter or half units when people are doing it regularly. So we don't often see someone calling a two or four or a four or two, you know, it's, it's borderline, is she too thin? Let's not get too bogged down on, on the actual quarter score of that. So I think that's potentially one road we could go down, trying to encourage farmers to do a little bit more body condition scoring, like keep it simple. And one of the points I really would like to get across today is that the effects of poor body condition score really are long term. It's not a case of if they're thin at one period of time, we can really make up for it very, very quickly. The results I'm going to share with you show that there's at least a 12 month um, uh, lag from poor body, body condition score. But depending how thin they get, it's actually a two or a three year um, effect. So we really do need to try and keep 
body condition score as, as, as sort of subtle a change as we can really just to avoid those massive peaks and troughs of condition um, in the long term it will be cheaper to do it that way because it does take more energy to put the body condition score back on those shoes so this is just um, it's quite a busy slide so I apologize for that um, but it's just talking about the, the different targets we have got for different times of the year. I don't know if the mouse shows up on your screen, it is on mine. So we've got sort of our focus on the lowland, really the other breeds are just half a score less. And it's more about the type of breeds you've got rather than, okay, thanks Liz, rather than how many feet above sea level you are. It's about how much productivity you're expecting from those ewes. So if you're expecting two, three lambs, then you need to be have, looking at the higher end of body condition score, not saying, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm quite high up, therefore it's only two and a half. No, it's about what they're expected to rear. Um, so we've got three and a half for tupping. And the advice now is to maintain that throughout mid-pregnancy. And in fact, really, when we update this in the next few weeks, that's going to be a three slash three and a half because we need to try and keep that condition on those ewes until lambing and then let them mobilise it through that lactation period. Letting them mobilise it beforehand does have a, a detrimental effect on performance through to weaning. Um, and really trying to emphasise that we shouldn't be getting ewes below two and a half by weaning, really, because it's a heck of an ass to get them from two and a half to three and a half anyway. But if you're asking to get them from two or even one and a half up to three and a half, they, they're just not going to do it. And there's already long term effects from from seeing that. So this is a really busy slide and I apologise for that, but you have no idea how many hours of number crunching actually went into that table. Um, so what we did in the, what we call the KPI project, um, and I have to sort of say, this was not just me. Um, Leslie Stubbings was massively involved in launching that. AHDB funded it and we had three fantastic farmers collecting all of this data and putting up with me, asking them questions for five years after the project finished what happened in 2014 and you know really having to go back into the data and, and look things up so a great big sort of thanks to, to all of those parties involved really it wasn't just me um but what we did is we gathered all this body condition score and live weight data of the ewes at weaning tupping scanning lambing eight weeks and then weaning again um and then we looked at so we'll sort of focus on that. So the first thing I did was I analysed all of the data looking at what are all of these effects on scanning results, because it's the first sort of marker of how your year is going to go. Um, and the two par parameters I looked at were proportion pregnant, which is just fancy speak for how many were pregnant, and then how many lambs those pregnant sheep had, because that is, you know, one of the most important questions. Are they pregnant? If so, how many lambs have they got? And what you'll see with the number that were pregnant is there were fewer factors affecting that. But what was really interesting is they were really strongly significant and both body condition score and live weight at scanning. But also that condition between mating and scanning um, was positively associated with pregnant ewes. So ewes who were gaining or maintaining condition were more likely to be pregnant. Now, what we've got to be careful here as well is we had really low empty barren rates in these farms. One farm was one and a half percent up to three percent. So really within those industry targets that we would be expecting. But then if you look at the litter size, there are so many factors affecting litter size all the way back to the body condition score and live weight of that ewe at the weaning of the previous production cycle is having an effect on what she's scanning the next year. Again, body condition score and weight at mating is as well. And then again, that importance of scanning body condition score, live weight and the change from mating and scanning. And it's this that's kind of forming the basis of that change in information about not allowing that half a unit score loss now between mating and scanning. But if you actually look at the literature behind that, it's, it's quite patchy. You've got lots and lots of different research and sort of half of it says, yes, you should. And half of it says, no, you shouldn't. But they sort of measure different things at different times. But this is looking specifically at, at scanning results. Then I went on to look at what are the effects of body condition score and live weight on, on, on what 
what's eventually born because you can have the best scanning in the world but if they don't actually end up on the floor born alive then then what's going on and I've just to reduce the tables I've kind of merged some of the aspects here but you'll see exactly the same thing as happening with how many actually lambed so this is out of those pregnant how many of them lambed and again, you're seeing you condition at scanning and that change between mating and scanning being significantly um, associated with, with having more ewes lambing. And then looking at the litter size at lambing, basically everything apart from that change between weaning and mating was having a significant effect on the litter size at, at lambing. So again, sort of re-emphasizing that need to look at body condition score and mating, particularly during that mating and scanning period, but also look by the weaning of the previous year, performance of scanning and performance of lambing has already been predetermined. So I think that's, that's quite powerful powerful stuff to to look at so I'm looking the time is going quite fast really I think I've already been 10 minutes um so then we looked at effects during lactation and this was looking at more of the effect of the lambs so when the lambs were born um what happened to them so we followed them through to weaning um we collected their weights at eight weeks and we collected it at weaning and I say we I didn't do any of the hard graft, I'm going to admit. I was just doing all the number crunching. Um, and weaning on this project was at 12 weeks. We had a target to um, try and get the lambs, each individual lamb of 20 kilos at eight weeks and 30 kilos at weaning. Um, and it did vary whether we achieved that by year and by farm. The 20 kilos at eight weeks was, was I'm not going to say easier, but that was achieved um, almost three out of three on most of the farms we were maybe about a kilo kilo and a half out on the on the average flock performance the weaning was that little bit harder um to get there so we were sort of thinking maybe that target needs to be brought down a little bit but it's always good to to have something to aim for and again all the way through to weaning of those lambs we continue to see that effect of weaning from the previous production cycle so pretty much what you weaned in 2021 will have an effect on what you wean in 2022 and potentially the following year as well if those ewes aren't given the right right sort of energy to, to put that condition back on and again looking at lamb performance we again saw you condition up to and at scanning affect lamb weights to weaning as well so it sort of continues all the way through on lamb performance directly not just um litter size at scanning and litter size at lambing and then other things that increased lamb weight basically higher body condition score at lambing meant we had heavier lambs at weaning and some of this you might think well that's not rocket science but actually it's it's the you know it's we've got massive data sets to to be looking at this um and and following that through the other thing was that basically condition loss between lambing and eight weeks resulted in higher lambs at weaning, but not to the detriment of having, ex, you know, skinny ewes by eight weeks, because ewes that were in better condition at eight weeks had heavier lambs at weaning, because what they then subsequently lost from eight weeks to weaning meant they had heavier lambs at weaning. So actually, when you think about it, you think, well, yeah, actually, that's quite logical. We need to be trying to keep that condition on that ewe until she lambs, mobilise it then until she's until she weans those lambs and then starts again. But when I say mobilise, we're talking about a unit. So really, ideally, and again, this is where you talk about textbook farming versus practical farming, but try and reduce those peaks and troughs and try and have just a maximum of a unit change um, during that, that lactation period. Um, Again, what I thought was interesting, and again, maybe not rocket science, but good to look for, we looked at a lot of this in terms of twins, because obviously ewes rearing twins are under a huge amount of pressure. And uh, the effects were greater in ewes rearing twins, but interestingly, ewes rearing singles, it was their condition at eight weeks and weaning was also significant on their effect on lamb performance. Um, at eight weeks, it was you know, quite a strong um, significance. It was less so at weaning at 0.024, but still the singles are going to be the ones that we're going to want finished off the farm quickly. We don't want them lagging behind if, if we're perhaps not letting the ewes be in the right condition at, at eight weeks. 
And just to try and put some of this into, into context, because it's all well and good saying, or better condition or heavier use. Um, there was a benefit of two kilos per lamb at weaning if you had a ewe that was a heavier body condition score at lambing. So the, the bigger data set we have was to compare three versus two. Some of, you know, we didn't have necessarily have a, a lot at all different body condition scores. So that's the strongest um, data that we've been able to get out. So two kilos per lamb at weaning based on um, lambing BCS. And this again is, is a re is, I think is a really good one for a unit BCS loss between lambing and eight weeks that equated to six kilos of combined twin weight at weaning. So that is the difference between hitting that 30 kilos and not hitting the 30 kilos. Um, but what we have to remember is that body condition has got to be there for them to be able to, to mobilize it. What we saw in the ewes that were slightly thinner by this point was they didn't have it to mobilize. So if they didn't have the feed in front of them, the lambs were suffering as a result of it. So it's just really important to be looking at that nutrition. If the condition is not on the ewe, the next best thing is to make sure that that feed is in front of her to, um, to make sure that the, the, the negativity is, is counteracted in some way. Uh, so so, three minutes, sorry, three minutes. Three yeah. minutes, okay. Um, so uh, Liz has just mentioned tools available. Um, and obviously I'm gonna say regular condition scoring um, and by palpation. So really put your hand on the use. And I did a survey as part of this thesis as well, which I might not get time to mention, but it's actually quite interesting to see how many farmers say how important they think condition scoring is, how often they do it, but then how they do it um, is, is still quite high by eye. And I'm not taking away farmer experience at all. My dad would, string me alive but when you've got a full fleece that will cover a multitude of sins eight weeks after sh being shorn it is already covering a multitude of sins so we really do need to be putting our hands on our backs we can't be assessing body condition score by eye for other vets and advisors in the group i don't, don't need to be telling you this but late pregnancy you've got your bhbs um urea and albumin levels and then during lactation Looking at lamb survival, growth rates as well, that's a key one. If you are tagging the lambs and able to look at daily live weight gains, that would be great. And then obviously looking at ewe mortality as well and disease incidents. So that was a survey, which I'm not going to massively thingy on because I haven't got much time, but I just wanted to highlight one interesting fact. So 99% of farmers thought body condition score was important at mating. 99% of farmers assess body condition score at mating. But interestingly, only 77% did it by hand and you've got 22% assessing you body condition score at mating by eye. Um, and interestingly, you know, we've got fewer doing it at eight weeks. Um, we've got, here we go, 78%. And, and with sort of this project's highlighting how important eight week performance is um, on, on future flock performance, but it is quite a new time period for commercial farms. I know we've talked about it in sort of the pedigree world for, for quite a long time. So in summary then, um, monitor you condition by handling the ewes, please, please handle them. Um, and really that it has a long-term effect. It's not something that we can just dip in and out of. It's something that's gonna take a long time to get right. Um, and then we need to try and stay there when we get there. Maintain or gain condition from mating to scanning. And really that condition needs to be there for, for lactation. And that eight weeks is a kind of good midpoint. Wait until weaning is too late. Um, so if we can bring it forward, it can then help us determine when we wean and try and sort of just cut, cut any um, poor condition and just give them that little bit more chance to, to recover. So I feel like I've gone really fast through that. Have I just been on time? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Just um, one question, a couple of questions for Neris, and then I'll ask um, Hugh and Kate to come back in to answer some, answer some others. Um, so Heidi here, she scanned Sheeling U's body condition score three to four as empty, where U lambs caught, have been caught more easily. How does body condition score affect affinity in Sheerlings differently to U lambs? Is there a chance you can get them too fit? 
you well you can you do see um what you tend to see when you use a two fit is you tend to see a reduction in scanning percentage rather than empty use so it's it's not as common to see fat use empty as it is that they'll have you'll have a really good good you she'll go through the scan crate and you think gosh she's going to be have two or three she's got one it's depressing as anything so that's what we tend to see in use that are two fit um so then there are so many factors that can can cause why yous are pregnant that are not body condition score related you know i'd be looking at abortion issues is there anything there that that's causing them to to not be pregnant from a from a disease perspective rather than looking at well not just looking at body condition score um but you sort of tend to see that you lambs you'd expect to see more shillings in lamb than than the you lambs okay and um joe would like a copy of link to your papers but you I, you have you put you haven't published them yet they're still in your thesis aren't you? So they're not readily available. no the only thing that's finished is my thesis um so um we we will we will getting papers published but the, we'll also be having a link for the website as well for something for for farmers um a, a summary of it so yeah when it's available i can send them around and i'm reading this one from emma Dr. Wright, because this is a novel, this is new. Uh, why do you think <laughs> that's, that farmers in the survey are less likely to think about body condition score in other periods? Did you get any qualitative data on that? Well, there's so many. So when you look at uh, lambing, some people actually put in the comments, don't like handling heavily pregnant sheep for body condition scoring. And you've also got that long sort of three four week period as well when body condition score over lambing so some will tend to do it as you know the first heptavac or something I was quite surprised that the scanning uh, body condition score was so was was lower but then I actually thought well actually the practicalities of body condition score when your scanner's there is actually not that easy is it it's a hectic day you've got people everywhere your scanner's not going to be very happy if you're holding up the line having me go put your hand on the you so I think it's it's then you will with all intents and purposes I'll get them in and body condition score them but it doesn't necessarily always happen um and what was interesting about the weaning which I didn't get a chance to cover was that farmers actually rated weaning as the least important time um that body condition score affects productivity so I think 70% rated it as very important or important. But interestingly, I think it was something like 80% did it. So they weren't thinking it was in, as important, but they were doing it and they were doing it by body condition score. And I think that's part of the weaning process, the, the going through and checking for the culls. So they check the udder, they'll check the teeth, they'll check the condition score. So they'll do it as part of a routine rather than, realizing that what they're doing is is important if that makes any sense thank you um so Hugh and Kate if you want to come back in for just the last 10 minutes or so what I also realized I forgot to say that if you are a Rosa member if you type your membership number into the chat function as I am about to um it we can pick it up from there in terms of your attendance so if you don't know your number um interesting question uh, Greg will answer that shortly anyway Question, the very quick one for Bryn, you said you on the uh, Q&A you'd answer it um, live, so about lupins, so someone asked a question about whether lupins could be used as a replacement for soil. Yeah, they can do, and they're a good, good source of a DUP. Um, Liz, the problem that we've had um, over the years is that they're really difficult to grow in the west of the country. Or well, to be fair, in a lot of places, it's not just the West. Well, even more difficult than the West, then. <laughs> Let's, yeah, um, yeah, and we've we've tried them in um, in whole crop mixes and all sorts, really. But just yeah, struggling with them, really. But from a yeah, if you actually get some, they're 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 a really good um, protein source. We did some trials at um, Rosemond years ago, Liz, on uh, lupins, and they worked very well. Yeah, it was just growing them consistently was our problem, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And there's a, um, a couple of questions, just sort of, I'm interested in your views, really. So one of the um, points that came up with, particularly after Kate's presentation about from Red Clover, is obviously a lot of farmers are putting in GS4s, which are these diverse mixes. Uh, herbal lays generally going to arable rotations. 
and potentially cutting silage off them. Have you got any experience of using them or they're likely to become more common? What and is the things we need to do from a, a, a silage analysis point of view as well? Well, there probably is, Liz, to accommodate all the different species that are being put into these mixes. I can't actually remember. Can you just remind me what's in this GS4 mix? So they, they have to be a certain number of grasses, legumes yeah. and herbs. So, yeah. And it, well, the GS4 officially has to have red clover in it. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a bit more complex in terms of analysis. And I guess all the laboratories are going to have to gear up to... Um, produce calibration curves for, for, for those forages, aren't they, as we get more of them. But they're going to produce some nice silages, I would suggest, um, which will be good feeding value and, um, you know, fairly high protein. So, yeah, I can see great potential for them, really. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, yeah, it's just hope. Well, there's other links in there in terms of the chat, but getting the analysis to catch up with what farmers are growing, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Farmers seem to be seem to be leading the way and we need to yeah do, do the work behind the scenes. Definitely. Um, and the other one was in terms of there was just a general question about how does body condition score affect protein and energy needs in late pregnancy? I don't know whether, well, who wants to take that one? Um. A thin ewe obviously um, is compromised um, in late pregnancy because she's not got body reserves. Her actual energy requirements to stay as she is aren't any higher. But if you wanted to gain weight, she needs more energy and protein. So, um, yeah. And, and bear in mind, if you um, uh, are you losing weight, generally generates some energy, but she doesn't really generate protein. So we've got to think about that really um but yeah if you want a you and it, it's a dicey thing to do is try and put a condition on a you in late pregnancy because what she tends to do is divert all that extra energy into her lambs and make them even bigger um, and she's quite poor by the time she lambs down she's got big lambs to feed which are hungry lambs so it is a tricky one so as Neris has pointed out very <laughs> ably that you know what we need to do is try to get them to lambing in good condition so they're not in that position that they're we don't need to feed them too much in those um late that late pregnancy phase and as we've worked out on uh, some of what Neris has done with Leslie um you know thin ewes are eating something like 30 percent more potentially they have a bigger appetite that'll fit you. So you need to budget for that extra food that they need actually with your grass budgeting or, or budgeting on silage that they will actually try to eat more. Thank you. Neris, do you have anything to add on that one? No, no, nothing to add. Um, another question that's come through, which is this, and I get it quite a lot in terms of transition diets. So in terms of when you're moving sheep off grass into a, into a shed, and then some of them might only be in a shed for a week or so and out again. Is there any, is there guidance in terms of that should actually be a minimum of two weeks or any thoughts in terms of how to manage that transition of different diets around lambing time? Uh, start, start earlier, Liz. Okay. <laughs> That's right, Bryn, absolutely. I think yeah. you've got to remember, I think, that, that the rumen takes a while to acclimatise to a new diet. And if you bring them in, I don't know, two days before lambing and expecting them to cope with a brand new forage and everything, the stress of that, the handling and everything is potentially um, a, a big problem. So the longer they have, as Bryn said, just start earlier, um, is a good thing. And, and if you're coming from out to in, have some of the in food outside before you come in. I think that's the, the thing to do. So gradually acclimatise the animal to the new diet. It's not so easy going the opposite way, of course, going from an inside diet to an outside, because what most farmers, most of us want to do is put them out to grass and lead them to it. Um, so that is a bit of a shock, but they're more able to cope with the shock post lambing than they are pre lambing mm. because of, you know, they're on a, they can be quite on a, on a, a knife edge energy and protein wise pre lambing, but post lambing, they need lots more energy, but their appetite has increased so dramatically that they're actually able to eat so much more. So start earlier, top tip, a couple of weeks. So ideally, and then, so it's sort of two, ideally minimum of two weeks before the start date, which means most sheep will be three weeks, basically, by the time the vast majority have started. Yeah. Uh, absolute minimum, Liz, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. Minimum. And start them off on, um, you know, on a, on a pound if you're on concentrates, isn't it? Because anything well, less. 450 grams for anybody on the metric system. Yes. <laughs> Um, anything less than they just, um, you know, the fatty who's have all the, all the feed, don't they? So, um, so there's a true feed salesman there, but 
Uh, yeah. I usually start a bit lower than that, Bryn. <laughs> I, I thought would you think... would, Kate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not I a bidding war. <laughs> the minimum you can feed is about a quarter of a kilo. I think absolute minimum. Absolute minimum, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you can't be feeding yeah. 0.1 of a kilo. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work, no. Yeah. i got a question for Neris regarding the research, uh, Neris. Um, did you see, or out of your research, did you see a strong correlation with the news and mastitis? No, we didn't actually. And it wasn't something we collected data on on every single farm, but one of the farms in particular um, recorded basically everything for me. He was amazing. I think he's actually on this call today. Um, and he kept a record of every single clinical case of mastitis. And he had six in a year out of a thousand ewes. So mastitis wasn't something that really featured on, on these three farms. But but interesting. It would, it would, low body condition score would be recognised as a risk factor, though, wouldn't it, in terms of... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't something we looked at here. Mm. But what I was going to say was what was really interesting out of those clinical cases that were identified, we followed through those lambs and every single one of those lambs were poor, poor lambs, basically. So they were nowhere near 20 kilos at eight weeks. They were nowhere near 30 at weaning and they were still there, you know, January, February, the following year, which you'd expect because the you had mastitis. I can't imagine how incredibly painful that must be trying to then rear lamb. So it would make sense. But in this project, it's not something that, that we saw, but it absolutely is a, is yeah and sort of not enough protein in the diet as well that's another sort of red flag for for mastitis um and final sorry final question just from kev really on on uh winter shearing basically so hope about eight weeks pre-lambing in terms of shearing um what is the impact on dry matter intake you condition score and lamb birth weights so I don't know. Do you want me to take this? Oh, sorry. No, 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 go on. It's your it's time. You well, we did. We it's didn't look. Me. We didn't look at this in the project. But I think um, they will eat. What's the? Is it 10, 15 ten fifteen percent yeah. more yeah. dry matter intake, yeah. and they yeah. will have um, heavier lambs as well. Yeah, but and you can actually get more in the shed. You can get more sheep in the shed <laughs> as well. Yeah. So get more in. Feed more at the feed base. Yeah, all sorts of advantages. Yeah, but you just need that regrowth by the time you turn them out. That's the yeah. thing, De you know, depending on what part of the world you are. But coming from quite a cold Welsh part of the world, you wouldn't want to be turning them out with not enough fleece cover. Um, so that's just something worth bearing in mind. I was with somebody who was um, shearing at five weeks pre-lambing today in Wales, which I, I did say I would say eight weeks, but <laughs> he was he was getting away with it at five weeks. So, yeah, it varies. But yeah. Yeah, and, and, to, and then cover um, snow comb and all sorts, isn't it? <laughs> there's always there's always some interesting stories to be found. There are, um, but thank you very much, Hugh, Kate, and Br um, Hugh, Bryn, Bryn. Harris, <laughs> and Kate. To get my names right, sorry about that. Um, I'm just gonna thank you very much for evening. Lots of positive comments. Again, if you want to put your Rosa number in the chat please do so and that's how we'll pick up your attendance this evening I'm just going to briefly hand you over to Greg who's just going to do a um just an intro well how you can get more information from Rose if you would like and who to speak to if you've got any questions yeah absolutely um yeah thanks Liz and, and also thanks all our speakers um tonight um I'm Greg I work at Basis and, and we've worked in as part of um to help kind of create Rosa alongside um NSA and it's been great to kind of join this evening and um, and learn a, learn a bit more as well about the about the sheep industry. Um, it's great to see so many kind of um, rows of numbers uh, coming in on the chat as well. Um, if you haven't got your two hundred number, just put your name and the fact that you're a rows of member in there, and I'll be able to pick it out and um, add the CPD points for your your account. Um, Rose has only been going kind of for the first um, kind of seven or eight months now, um, and it's great to see so many members joining. We are working as hard as we can to kind of um, increase the recognition for it, and we think it's a fantastic initiative to help support kind of um, sheep farmers and get advisors the recognition they um, kind of they want to help kind of really push the industry forward. So um, we'll definitely be trying to run more events and webinars like this. We're also really looking forward to attending some live events. Hopefully this summer we were very disappointed when they were all cancelled for the first um, for our first kind of summer of being part of the sheep industry. Uh, but if anyone's got any feedback or ideas or wants to know any more, 
then please just go to the Rosa website, which is sheepadvisors with an e, um, dot co dot uk, or just email sheepadvisors at basis dash reg dot co dot uk, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions and take any feedback and um, take all your ideas on board. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, and the hope is that the next webinar will be sort of later into Feb and it will be focusing on sort of regenerative and holistic grazing techniques. So um, look out for that. So that will be out. Uh, date will be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, again, thank you very much, all the speakers. Thank you for those people asking questions and uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.